thanks everybody for coming. We're getting a little bit of a late start. I'm, my name is Rebecca Polson. I'm the board president of the Sitka Maritime Heritage Society. And um, we've been around a while. Um, and this is one of the main things we do is um, basically live oral history, participatory live oral history, maritime topics. And um, yeah, this past year, um, we've got a new executive director, who I'll introduce in a moment. And, um, and then our board currently is myself, um, uh, Joe Darienzo, John Dunlap, uh, Chris Bruton, uh, Grant Miller, and Mike Littman. And um, this is what we do, and then we're also working to fix up the Japonski Island Boathouse as a working maritime heritage center. Um, and we'll be doing more work on that this coming year. We're going to do some brainstorming. And also, we, are, um, we have uh, two empty seats on our board, and so if this looks like interesting kind of uh, stuff to you, then uh, contact any one of our board members and we're going to be leaping in after this into um, we've got a, a grant to put in a ground source heat pump on the building and we also want to figure out how we can get the building in use as soon as possible um, and um, this also this is our annual meeting and our um, ballots uh, and we've gone to an annual membership so you need to uh, renew for 2013 um, and then the ballots are on the back table for our board. Um, and here is Ashia Lane, our new executive director. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We're really excited about our panel tonight. We've got six wonderful women joining us to talk about their experiences in the fisheries um, as fishermen and women. <laughs> um, I'd like to say thank you to Eric Jordan, who is guiding the conversation tonight. Um, yes, please. Um, Sarah Jordan helped me acquire these beautiful quilts that are on loan from Janine Holzman. Um, we had little bits of help from different places. SCS lent me a cord for the slideshow. Thank you guys. <laughs> um, we've had great promotion with Sitka Daily Sentinel and Raven Radio, and it's just felt really nice to put a community event together. Um, so, I would just like to briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Tella Adson, with. <laughs> um, she's co-captain of the NERCA, and she'll tell you all, everyone will tell you about their experiences, but she's come up from Washington to be with us today and share her story, which I think is really cool. Um, Linda Bankin. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Uh, she works with Resource Advocacy and um, Alaska Longlines Fishermen's Association, and she fishes, and yeah, you do a lot, sorry, <laughs> stuttered out there. Uh, Linda Danner, skipper and fisherman for 37 years, right, entering 38th season, um, you're fishing on the Amberjack. Correct, and uh, she's joining us from right here in Sitka, Pat Kehoe. <laughs> um, Pat is a fisherman and artist and raised the girls on the boat with Howard, um, lest we forget the gentleman. Um, <laughs> and she has recently stopped fishing, but has a good bit of stories to share with us. Uh, Marie Laws. Marie fished in the 70s and 80s, I believe you told me, out of Sitka with her husband. And she hasn't fished for some time, instead focusing on her art, so thank you. And then Coral Pendle, who is co-captain with her sister Katie, new addition kind of to the troll fleet as a female skipper, and 
we're really excited to have all these women here sharing their stories. And that's all. I'm going to turn it over. Um, after the panelists talk, then we're going to have a little break, a slideshow. We'll be playing with some pictures that folks sent in. Um, husbands, brothers, women themselves, everybody sent in pictures of their fishing experiences, <coughs> which is great. And I had a few people say, well, she, I don't have pictures. We don't stop to take pictures. <laughs> um, but we still ended up with over 100, which is really great. And thank you all very much. Thanks. Let's have a warm welcome for the panel and the thank of Sheila who's done a tremendous job waiting. It's a real honor for me to be invited back to facilitate these discussions by the Sitka Maritime Heritage Association every year. And I'm especially honored this year with this panel. The format is that for the first hour or so, before the break, I'll ask each panel member to tell their story. And uh, we might have some discussion here if their story elicits a follow-up question from somebody on the panel or hopefully in a rare occasion from me. And then, during the break, we'll have a break after about an hour, and we'll have a slideshow uh, that's been put together, that Ashia has put together. And then we'll come back and we'll have audience participation. And uh, I know several people have indicated they want to come up and tell their stories. And if I haven't heard from you, any of the women in the audience are welcome to come up and tell their story. And we'll, we'll have a 45 minutes of an hour for that, and that will conclude the evening. So I've asked each panelist to tell their story, how they've come to be involved in the fisheries, and some of the special challenges of being a woman in the Alaska fisheries, whether it's growing up on the boat, or skippering your boat, or raising kids on the boat. So without further ado, we're going to start with Linda Binken. How did you come to be involved in Alaska's fisheries, Linda? Um, well, I, I came up to Alaska in 82, and I, I think grew up want, liking wild places and wanting to see Alaska. And actually, my sister, Nancy, who's also a fisherwoman, should be up here too, because she hates these kind of public things, so she's high. She came up here first and um, was kayaking with friends and did a little fishing and was sending her journal to me. So I was hooked before I even got here. Um, but I took me a while to find a job on, the boat, on a boat. That was 82 and there weren't that many women fishing then. Um, and I eventually got a job in the longliner and worked with the Chevaliers for that summer. And that's when pre IFQs, pre derbies, we black cod fished all summer long with um, a family-run boat with a two-and-a-half-year-old Josh Chevalier on board. Um, and I, I loved it. It was really hard work, and we weren't making much money. Black Cod was 29 cents a pound or something then. Um, that dates me, huh? But, um, yeah, I loved working on the water and, and uh, just the, whole, the community of fisher people in um, the harbors is what I... I, um, I don't know, I think that's, it was the whole community aspect of the fishing fleet is what really drew me to it. And I fished on a couple other boats that summer. I worked with the Sea Boys as well, doing the whole rockfish boogie, fresh fish thing, and um, that was a lot of fun. And then just kept coming back until I finished college and could move up here. Linda, before we go on to the other panelists, how, when did you decide to start being a representative of the fishing industry instead of being a crew member? And when did you decide to run your own boat? Those are two short questions for you. <laughs> oh, I give short answers. That's my specialty. Um, I uh, very actually it was very one event that made me decide to go back to grad school actually and become an advocate. I um, was fishing near a trawl boat. Um, we were up 
off of, I think we were west of Yakutat, but anyway, there was a, a trawler that fished near us and there was just dead fish floating on the surface everywhere. Um, and I wanted to figure out a way to do something about that and thought to be a more effective advocate for the resource in the fishing industry, I should go to grad school. So I did and came back and um, soon after that decided to, well, I guess it was a year after I graduated, I decided to buy my first boat. And I don't know, I think it was just years of people encouraging me to do that and say, telling me, you know, you could run your own boat if you want to, that I decided to go for it and do that. And folks, just so you know, what a formidable advocate for the fishers is trawling. Ground fish trawling is prohibited in the federal waters of southeast Alaska because of Linda Benkin. <laughs> Next, I'd like to ask Pat Keel to tell her story, how she became involved in the fisheries and especially the challenge of raising two daughters on a small fishing boat. Thanks, Eric. Nothing like the easy questions. Um, well, first of all, I want to say that I'm, I look around the room and I'm in awe. There are so many women that have been involved in fisheries over the years. I, you know, I look all through the audience and there are people. And then I look behind me at these quilts and I think, I used to work like crazy on the boat, you know? And Janine Holtzman would not only be working like crazy, she'd make a quilt in a trip. I, you know? I, <laughs> just, uh, and so did Sarah, yeah, it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm a lightweight. <laughs> just, well, I guess I had gone through school and gotten a real job and, and worked down south for a while and then I just wanted an adventure and so I talked a friend who's sitting in the audience into coming up and and we arrived in Sitka um, 1980 and I wanted to go fishing so I kind of wandered around and checked out boats and you know got to know people around the fishery and eventually found a job um, first I think black codding, that see, uh, in those days black cod was like the entry level fishery, I, you know, when, when, I think it was 33 cents a pound for black cod when I started, and we worked like crazy, and we didn't make any money at all, but, <laughs> but I learned a lot, <laughs> and I guess one of the main things, I mean, I'd always been kind of a wimpy kid, I wasn't very strong, and um, when you get out on the boat, you know, if you can, if you can be smart about it and um, just work extremely hard, you can make it. And so it was really, I mean, it was really exhilarating that you could actually be out there and, and fishing. You're bringing these huge, big halibut on board, and it, it just was, it was so exciting. I loved it, and I never really looked back. Um, then there was a period um, I fished. A friend, Sherry Lyons and Karen Smith, who some of you probably know, we fished, her, Sherry's husband was gonna be off fishing on somebody else's boat, so we put the teddy together um, and fished the teddy one opening back in the derby days and did pretty well, it was fun. Um, had a lot of interesting experiences. Um, we kind of had three skippers on the boat that time round. It was, it was um, when I, Sherry maybe was a little higher skipper than the rest of us, but when it was blowing 50 and she wanted to go out, the rest of us said no. <laughs> no, we're not going. We don't care what you say. Um, so um, it just kind of went along and I, I think I probably, I was looking at getting my own boat and then I met Howard and the rest is kind of history and instead of running my boat, I, I settled into a, you know, the, the deckhand role and, and then we raised the kids on the boat and it was a wonderful life. It was just, um, you know, being so fortunate is to have your kids out on the boat with you and 
kind of learning and working together and exploring things. It was it was great. And now I'm working for benefits, but you know, I still have the fishing to look back on. I was putting my phone up here. It's not a good time to remind you all that if you've forgotten to turn off your phone, you might. I'd forgotten. That's my fault. Yeah, I was my son calling, but uh, he can wait. I have a special question for you, Pat. I, I grew up with three little sisters on the boat. So I know there's a special challenge to raising young women on the boat. And I know you, you must have a story or two, a short story about raising two young women on the boat. A challenge, I, it was always interesting. Um, I thought it was perfectly normal, but I mean, other boats in the fleet thought that when there were people up on the wheelhouse doing ballet, that it was kind of an odd boat. <laughs> um, you know, no, it was great. We, we homeschooled on the boat. They had, well, we, we made the wheelhouse bunk into a, we put netting up, and um, that was just kind of the playpen, and um, we all lived there. <laughs> A little like being in jail, but no, it, I, I wouldn't say it was challenging, really. They learned to, to fish on the boat. First they'd scrub bin boards, and then they'd do the dishes on the back deck in a pot of water, and yeah, I, they may have thought it was challenging. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that. <laughs> Which brings up our next panelist, um, which is kind of new for the Sitka Maritime Heritage Society panel. Tella Andelson has traveled all the way from Bellingham to participate in this panel tonight. And uh, that's, that's a new, thank you. And Tella has experiences both uh, crewing with her mother and also, uh, she has launched a fishing writing career. And uh, so without further ado, Tella, please share your story with us. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think that my identity as a fisherman is really kind of a four-part evolution. And the way that it started was my parents were veterinarians in Wasilla who wanted to build a sailboat in a landlocked backyard and had a dream of going to sea. And they, it took seven years to build that boat, and it was quite a project. And when it was done, we set off across the Gulf as a family of three um, and without a real plan, and we landed in Sitka, and that was the first place we made landfall, and it was 1984. I was seven, and there were trolling families all over the docks in Thompson Harbor. And my parents thought, oh, this looks like a pretty cool way to make a living. Let's do this for a little bit. And so they rigged up this sailboat as a hand troller, little davits on the side, and um, very quickly learned that if we were going to actually support a family and make a living this way, they were going to have to do it a little differently than that. I just recently went through their old log books and would see like the first day, oh, we got two coho today and 19 humpies. And that was, there were exclamation points after this. So, um, so they had a steep learning curve. And two years later, they built the 54 foot Willie Lee second, which is still down in New Thompson. And we did that as a family for the next few years and got a little better and learned a few things. But my dad, while he was really grateful for his experiences fishing and like Pat said, thought it was just the most amazing privilege, he didn't see that we'd be able to make a living at it you know, to long term. And so he got a land job, and a real job, 
And my mom wasn't ready to give up. She was committed to making it as a fisherman. So she kept the Willie Lee, and I was her crew starting when I was 13. Um, my folks ultimately split up, and my mom and I did that together for six years, which, looking back, you know, you would think, oh, that must have been a really special time for you. <laughs> people, people have said that to me. <laughs> and it was not. Uh, I was a really angry teenager, and a 54-foot boat became very small. My mom put in a freezer system so we could stay out until the boat was full, and the fish hold on the Willie Lee is enormous. We, we made one 26-day trip out of Yakutat, and um, that was a very long trip. So, and ultimately, my dad, in our case, my dad was right. We weren't able to make a living fishing because my mom had sunk everything into putting the freezer system in, and we had a few bad seasons, and she had to sell the boat. So... What I saw of boat kids growing up was that there was kind of a division between kids who either loved fishing and the life they were getting or the kids who couldn't get away fast enough. And I had been one of the ones who was fantasizing about the people I wanted to go work with when I didn't have to work for my mom anymore. And so that was an opportunity. And I went to work for some other guys and they were safe boats in a physical and a sexual sense. That wasn't an issue. But I learned that it's not just about tension with a family member, but ideologically how tough it can be to share a boat space um, with someone that you don't see eye to eye on stuff. And so I left a fishing. I took about a six year break and I was pretty bitter when I left. I was I was mad about being teased by my captains about being the liberal little college girl and I was mad about being told that I'd grow out of my idealism and all that. And I was frustrated with some of the entitlement that I saw at the time and not good use of resources. So I left and did social work in Seattle for six years, practiced my idealism, and then I got really broken inside this time. I got really burned out and the natural thing to do and the only thing that I knew how to do was to come back to fishing. And it's been wonderful. That was in 2004 and it was the, the physical work, like, also like Pat said, that allowed me to put my broken bits back together again. And that was really important at the time. And also then, I fell in love with another boat kid, Joel Brady Power, who had grown up on the Nurka, and I was really resistant to going to work with him, though. He had just taken over, just bought his dad's boat, and was a 22-year-old skipper, and I didn't want to be the captain's girlfriend. After all the time that I'd put in fishing on my own, that felt somehow like a demotion to me. Going to work with the person that I loved somehow seemed like it was taking a role that was less. So that was, that was a hard thing for me to come to terms with. But ultimately, when you're watching you know, the boat with your sweetheart on, passing on the drag, and you're waving every night, and looking across the anchorage, that got harder. So, <laughs> so the, this coming season will be the eighth year that Joel and I have run the NERCA together. And in the beginning, there were a lot of fights on board as um, he was coming to be comfortable running the boat and I was coming to be comfortable knowing how to work with my partner. And it's better now. And now I feel really, really fortunate that I can have the life that I love with the person I love and that I, the things that drove me away from fishing at a time, I don't have that problem anymore because I see how much, um, how many different belief systems and values there are in our fleet. And I see people like Linda Binken and Alaska Trollers Association and all of us who are working to ensure this future, um, which is a 
pretty big concern right now as so many boats are up for sale and so many of our fleet elders are retiring. So that's, that's something I think about a lot is who will keep this going. So seeing Coral here is a, a big celebration to me. Wow. A lot of us have been there. Let's have a big hand for that story. Tella has a lighter side, too. Are you sure? And uh, following her blog, um, I know that she has a boat cap. And uh, could you tell the story of uh, your cat talking to the crows briefly? Technically, it's illegal for freezer boats to have pets on board, Eric. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Nobody's um, <laughs> Right. Right. <laughs> um, I think this is a story about a cat that was on your boat while you were tied to the dock between trips, right? Yes, that's right. And, um, well, you know, we're uh, stall 414 down there, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty fond of the corvids. And then I like them, and we have a couple resident crows that seem really happy to see us come in from our trips and uh, make some appearances on the cap rail and make their little noises calling for treats. And Bear then gets very excited to see her friends and uh, has some conversations. I, I think you heard the, the noise she makes, perhaps better than I could do it. Maybe you could. <laughs> when, when I was looking at this group, and then, as she had written up the thing of how I would lead this panel, I said, no, 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 take that word out. That isn't what's going to happen. <laughs> no, anyway, it's great. Uh, you want to tell people how they can find your blog and, and view the video of your cat talking to the uh, crows? That's a good compromise. Uh, <laughs> I think it's in the um, newsletter that she put together. It's uh, teleadson.com and the blog is hooked. So, thanks. Great. Well, our next panelist um, grew up on the boat and has become her own skipper and has a unique experience of being co-skippers with her sister. Please welcome Coral Pendle. sister and we grew up fishing and I was one of the lucky ones that loved fishing when I was little um, at least when I was very little you know you <laughs> dissect all the fish you got to see all these great places hang out with your family all the time forts and art projects and and a lot of fish dissection and eyeballs in the different bins and <laughs> if you were really lucky you got your parents to fill the tote with some boiling water along with the the hose so that you could swim around in the tote. And if you were extra, extra good, they'd put in one of those little, little baby fish that I think you're supposed to throw back. They threw back most of them, but if it was obviously gonna die, you know, it could go in the tote with us. And we'd swim around with it, and, and then it, it would turn upside down. So, we'd try and get it right side up again. Um, so yeah, so it was fun. Up, up until this point, probably about High school? Middle Could school. I, I think middle school. <laughs> when I had friends all of a sudden and friends who got to do fun things in the summer and, and go camping and, and experience all these other things. And all of a sudden fishing was the worst punishment there could possibly be. You couldn't talk to anyone. You couldn't call anyone. Um, I'd come back to town after a month or so and Everyone had done all these great things, and I'd missed it, and I hadn't met those people who'd just come to town. And, and so I think when I was 14, I told my parents, I'm not fishing anymore. I hate this. I never want to do this again. Um, I'm going to get a, 
a job on land, I'm going to live with somebody in town, and I'm, I'm not going. I'm never going again. And I got a job at a gallery and worked with tourists for one summer. <laughs> all summer. <laughs> and uh, dealt with all of those great people who would come into the store. And, uh, and I fished the next summer. And I never, <laughs> I never mentioned again uh, how much I hated fishing. And I think a few years after that was when Carl, short, Eric's son, got his first boat. And I remember talking to my sister and having this fantasy where we were both out on our own boats and, and we, were, we were doing it, you know, and, and we'd talk back to each other and we'd have our own little coding group and how exciting that would be. And I think um, in 2009, I was 21 and my sister was 17, um, we decided to buy Linda Bankett's boat, the Morgan. And um, rather than fishing two separate boats and trying to pull that off, we thought it would be simpler to co-run and co-own the boat. Easy. We'll just, we'll just do it together. As if we were one skipper, right? Two skippers on the boat. And I think there are a few people in the audience who told me that that was not possible. That you cannot have two skippers on one boat. And we said, oh no, we're, we're going to do that. And so since then, this I guess will be our fifth season fishing together. Um, and we've done it to this point. This is our last season together. We sort of wrote up a little contract between the two of us, um, identifying a five-year point when we would revisit the contract and we would decide if we wanted to fish separately or continue fishing together. Um, and I think this next year will be our last year together. And then, and then we go through this kind of parallel divorce process where we figure out, you know, who buys what boat and how you divide up all of our everything, gear and electronics and hours put in and she's been in college and I've been here and all of that. So, so that's our next uh, growing project. But it's been a great process. Um, yeah, and, and here we are. You're five together. So I call over to visit with uh, Coral and Katie on the drag, and I, I've kind of deduced how they've worked this out. One of them is running the boat while the other one is sleeping. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the great things about running a boat with your sister that you grew up with all along is that we do things almost the same way. So I trust her to run the boat as much as she trusts me to run it. Um, I know exactly the point at which she'll wake me up if something goes wrong and vice versa. And so you can trust that person as much as you trust yourself. And so it's been really handy. Yeah, we, we probably sleep more than some others in the fleet. <laughs> at that moment, we're like, oh, one of us can go to, all right. It's me, my turn. Um, but we also solved it by making skipper of the day. Because that first year, the alarm would go off, and it's that, it's that thing. You push it, your turn, my turn. No, we don't have turns. You just turn it off and turn it off. We'd wake up at 9 when we were supposed to get up at 2 or 3. And so we figured it out by the end of that first year. And by year 2, um, we developed a system, skipper of the day. We alternate your morning, my morning. If you miss, if you miss the alarm on your morning, you're in big trouble. <laughs> but it, but we alternate all of those different roles. Pretty much, pretty much everything. Well, I'm sure we could hear a lot more about how that works. Um, <laughs> our next panelist is. Uh, she doesn't remember, but I actually met her way back in the 70s. And um, we've worked together on uh, various groups. And uh, I, I won't tell some of the stories that uh, I know about Linda Danner here right now. Is this my <laughs> She has a reputation 
as one of the toughest fishermen, trollers in southeast Alaska, man or woman, big boat or small boat, and she has one of the smallest trollers in the fleet. Please welcome Linda Danner. this great story. At Linda Bacon, I don't know if this was the ad, I saw an ad that the Chevaliers put, and it was at the top of the dock at A and B, and it said, wanted midget bisexual deckhand. <laughs> Now you be careful here on uh, telling her the stories, or I might tell some on you. Oh, please do. <laughs> um, at, the end of, at the end of the day, it's really just an ad I saw on the, on the board, really. It was really terrific. I thought that was one of the funniest ads I've ever seen, and true to the point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, maybe not entirely, but you guys get the you guys get it, right? Oh, God. Well, I'd have to say the reason I got into fishing, honestly, is because I was chasing my luggage around. I uh, had taken a month uh, a leave of absence from uh, Tektronix in Portland, Oregon, where I've been working for a couple of years, because like Linda, I was just totally enamored with wilderness and had been raised in the Willamette Valley and thought, uh, yeah, I think I'll go to Alaska for a month. So I take a ferry ride up, and I get up and catch a can, and I get on the ferry again, I get up in June, and I go for a walk up, walk up you know, Gold Creek, and I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty spectacular, and then I think I'm going to go on the big adventure, I'm going to get on a float plane, I'm going to go to this town called Elfin Cove. I bought this little backpack. Oh. And, well, I get off in Elf, no, 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 I was going to go to Pelican. I, had nothing, I didn't even know about Elfin Cove, that's what it was. And so when I booked my flight, it was to Pelican. Well, I got off in Elfin Cove thinking that that was Pelican, <laughs> only to have my bag continue on to Pelican. Right? So as soon as I got off the float plane, it didn't take me long before I realized, well, now, oh, she would like to find my bag. <laughs> and I said, so I, so I remember walking up the, the dock in this really tiny little community, and the, I went up to this person, I said, so, where do you catch a bus to Pelican? <laughs> How do you get there, man? <laughs> well, and they said, oh, no, 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 there'll be no bus catching, but you can catch a packer. And I said, well, what's a packer? And they said, well, you know, Paul Johnson's running the nowhere there, and he's going to go out to Deer Harbor, and he's going to pick up some fish, and then he's going to go on to Pelican and go ask Paul Johnson. So I walked over to Paul Johnson and said, well, by the way, you know, so I was hoping to catch a ride with you to Pelican, and on the way, he told me about this guy that was looking for a deckhand, and was I interested? And I said, nah, 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 I'm here on vacation, man. You know, if there's anybody who's this guy up here I'd like to see, because at the end of the day, I was 23, wasn't it all about boys? <laughs> so I thought, yeah, maybe I'll see Ed West, that'd be groovy, but at the end of the day, I'm really just trying to catch up with my pack. And as it turned out, I ended up, when we pulled into Deer Harbor to, uh, <laughs> to take on these fish. I had no idea. I was your class. I really, truly didn't understand where fish came from. You know, your styrofoam bed with the wrap around, nice wrap around it, you know. And, uh, but I loved the wilderness. And we're pulling into Deer Harbor, and sure enough, there's the one guy I did want to see, Ed West, standing on one of these trollers. And he invited me on to, uh, on his vessel with Sid Chero, Warden, Warden Eldridge might remember him. And so, I, indeed, I jumped, I got off right then, and Ed said, yeah, we'll be going to Pelican in a couple of days, you can catch your bag then, and not a problem. I said, great, I'll spend a couple, three days on the back deck of the boat. And I was riding around, and on day three, when we were heading to Pelican, I'll never forget it. I looked out the back deck, and it was covered with fish. And I looked at those guys in the cockpit, and I turned to Sid, and I said, do you mean to say you make your living like this? <laughs> and from then on, I knew. I got to Pelican, I picked up my pack, I called my boss in uh, Tektronix, and I never went back. So I spent that winter in Goddard, and I, once again, Ward Eldred saved me by bringing me a box of food in March. After, he said, I remember you've been here for a couple, three months now, Danner. <laughs> 
And he, and, he, uh, and he dropped the food by, and I got, and then he said, I'll come pick you up in about three weeks. I said, that's a plan, it's springtime. So I came back to town, and, and now you gotta remember I was 23, and that was in, what, 74. And at that time, one of the greatest irritations from the fishermen that I had spoken to is that women slept with their skippers. And I really wanted to go to work on a boat, but I couldn't find anybody I wanted to do that with. <laughs> um, I thought, um, and it was George Hicks. And I was walking down the dock, and George, George says, Linda, you know, there's this boat named the Chinook that, you know, that might be available for lease. And I said, yeah. He says, yeah, why don't you go talk to the widow? The husband died last year in a tragic accident. I know she's not interested in fishing the Chinook, so why don't you go talk to her? And I went up to her door and knocked on her door, and I remember I lied. I told her that I knew so much. I mean, I dropped all the words. I dropped spooks and stabilizers and decks and girdies, like all the language I didn't know anything about. I'd fished three weeks the year before. <laughs> and, uh, and she agreed to lease me the boat. And I, I fished the boat in 1975 and bought it that year and been fishing ever since. And that's how I got into the industry. And about some Saturday. <laughs> that takes us to 1975, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> you must have a story about being a woman, running the drag, or dealing with this male-dominated industry that you'd like to tell us that happened between 1975 and now? Well, I've got my PhD in male industries, so I must admit. It. <laughs> you know, there, there truly are, but I guess the one thing I'd really like to say is that when I first started fishing, I mean, a lot of it was really, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk to boys about something other than just blah, 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 shoes and clothes. And I wanted to be able to say something that they, I could engage them in, like, let's talk about hydraulics. <laughs> you know? That's uh, something that, you know, on the same level. And it was in that, I must admit, that was a huge motivation to begin with. But it didn't take long but I went before I thought, wow, boys have more fun. <laughs> oh, there we have it, boys have more fun. And it isn't so much about being in a male industry as much as what I've taken from it is that I like being both sides of it. I really love that I saw how resourceful men were and I so appreciated that and I wanted that for me. And what that did was it it gave me the motivation to do things that I knew nothing about, thinking, well, shit, if they can do it, I can too. You know, can I talk like that on the radio? <laughs> um, that I felt like, I felt, I felt a, I felt an even, I, I was interested. And yet at the same time, I was just as interested in how women were. You know, I really liked the way that women are more, more comfortable around, like, in other words, I've had men and women crew. And I really like that women in general, there's not the power struggle. You know, so I get that, I really liked that, and wanted to nurture that. And at the end of the day, I really liked that men did things that they knew nothing about. And I felt no, uh, I didn't feel intimidated by doing that myself because I had half the gender of the world to demonstrate it. It was terrific. You know, I felt a part of it, not a separation from it. And I think that the only really, the one aspect of it, I'm gonna hold back because it's a question I really wanna ask Coral because it's so many generations later and I wanna see if it still exists. So I'd like to not go there yet. Let's save that until after we hear from uh, 
Marie. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Marie Laws fished in Southeast Alaska and I know Marie because we've been on aqua aerobics together for a number of years. <laughs> Just can't leave the water alone, I guess. <coughs> Marie, tell us your story. Well, I'll start with saying that uh, I was raised with fishing. Um, I lived on a gold mine in Lysiansk Inlet until they built Pelican. And then they built Pelican because they called it closest to the fish. They built it strictly as a fishing town, so everybody in my family either fished or worked with fish. And uh, I think a lot of people here probably knew Oso Pete. He was my real uncle. He was my father's brother. and. Um, He's got so many stories, most of the world knows them too, I think. But, um, oh, another little aside on Uncle Pete. When we were fishing, oh, I better go back to why we started fishing, because um, my entire family and everybody I knew were fishermen and had boats. And I would get on a boat and I was perfectly at ease, knowing they could take care of everything. You know, if something went wrong, they knew how to fix it. And so I never was uncomfortable, even if it was rough. And, um, and then uh, this good little guy came to Pelican. And um, we ended up getting married and leaving town. And I moved to California. And he worked for AT&T. And we were down there for couple of years and then moved to Washington again with Bell Telephone. And, um, and then, by golly, we decided to come back to Alaska. <laughs> and so we moved to Anchorage. He took a telephone job with the Anchorage Telephone. So we moved, in, moved to Anchorage about 61. And I was perfectly happy. It was fine. And then, uh, oh, 1972. He had a midlife crisis, and he found this beautiful ship called the White Eagle. <laughs> and so uh, we went fishing. Um, he came down, bought the boat in Juno for me, almost out of the coat. And then uh, the next summer, I came down and fished with him. And our girls were teenagers then, and they lived in Uncle Pete's cabin on the beach out at Sunnyside and uh, fished uh, halibut out of a skiff. And uh, that was the first commercial fishing I did when I was a kid, fish halibut from a skiff. We would set out skates. And uh, so then we got to the point where we were on a boat of our own, and I started realizing what you have to know while well, Bert hadn't been raised on a fishing boat. Uh, the most experience he had was on a gasoline tanker in the Navy. He was a radio man um, out of Honolulu. <laughs> so, I mean, he did manage to see some seas and what have you on the way to Guam and all those other places out there. Um, but he loved it, and I, I think that was the happiest time of my life was when we were on the boat. Uh, you have no idea how it is to watch someone that you love just enjoy what he was doing so much. Every day when he learned something new, he was so excited. He was like a kid in a candy store. And he was that way always on the boat. So the reason that we started getting off the boat was they started having closures. I think a lot of people here didn't fish during the time that it opened in April and closed in September. And that's how we had it when they started having all of these closures and all the political changes going on with the fishery. We went, whoa, we better find out a way to supplement our fishing because, you know, it was either that or go long lining or whatever. So uh, he knew telephoning very well. So 
we started this little company called Sea Talents. And uh, he still fished until we ended up getting more customers. They weren't accustomed to some new poor people coming to town. And so uh, one thing I wanted to mention was we didn't have radar on our boat when we came up. And of course, there were no GPSs at the time. And uh, I was so fortunate to have my Uncle Pete and some of the other old timers out fished with me because they knew my family and they shared their landmarks. And that was how we fished was with landmarks. We had some that you could change for when it was foggy and some that you could change <coughs> different ways. I'm sure you had some of that in your time too. And uh, if it was our anniversary, Uncle Pete would come over and we'd see your landmark. So we got to, <laughs> we got to fish a uh, porcupine and uh, those places out around uh, Lizzie's Green was some of my favorite fishing. I forgot roughly going fish around Esther Island or State Group or something. But anyway, that was my fishing story. Maria, that's just wonderful. Let's give Marie a big hand. Well, we're a little ahead of schedule, so I'm going to tell a story of my mother, who was um, just loved fishing. And you mentioning landmarks. That's a lost art now with all our electronics. My mother could triangulate a landmark in seconds. And when I took her fishing starting in the late 70s, early 80s, early 80s, she remembered landmarks from the 40s. It was amazing. But working with my mother was a special challenge. So I said one morning, I said, Mother, in order for you to keep coming with me, and she almost came every fall for almost a month, I said, we have to have some rules. She says, what? What kind of rule? What do you mean? I said, rule number one, I talk first in the morning. <laughs> she would wake up an hour before I was ready to get up and start asking me about where we were going, what lures we were going to use, who we were going to be talking. Mother, I talk first in the morning. <laughs> Two, I decide who the coding partners are. I come into the cabin one day and she had her own little list that she was stuffing into her bra. <laughs> that she had set up a code with Shirley Perkins' husband, Chuck Pedra, unbeknownst to me. And she'd been in there coding him our scores. <laughs> So I decided the coding partner. Three, you cannot take your nap in the middle of the day in your rain gear in my sleeping bag. <laughs> Four, it doesn't matter if Joe cut you off in 1950. We are not repaying him in 1984. So we're going to get to the section now if any of you want to ask each other questions. And I know, Linda, you already said you wanted to ask uh, Coral a question. If any of you heard any stories, and right after we get through with this section of panelists, if something's come up they want to ask each other, then we'll take a break and for about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll have audience participation. So this is your chance to ask each other some questions that their stories may have prompted. We'll start out with Linda. Linda. Yeah. Okay. So Eric, I'm going to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. so. Is that on? Hello, hello. Yeah, Eric. All right, fine. So how did that work out when Sarah came on board? <laughs> <laughs> the rules were for me. <laughs> question for Coral, being that we're both single women in the industry. When I first started out, it kind of went like this. Oh yeah, isn't that cute? There's this female fisherman out there. Oh yeah, I bet she's a dyke. 
<laughs> and then it was, well, I was 23, and there was some, you know, we, there was some sexual activity amongst the other fishermen. So then it was like, oh, wow, she's promiscuous. And then there came a time when I actually did stay with a woman for a little while, and then it was like, ah, I was right all along. <laughs> well, now I'd like to know if you, Coral, ever have any of these issues come up. <laughs> I mean, is this a problem? Do you have to have this conversation with the, with the fleet still now, what, 30 years later? And, and do we get to talk about this in front of her mother? <laughs> um, my sister and I have, uh, since we bought the boat, been pretty convinced that half of the employees in all the restaurants in this town think that we're a couple. Especially because I have the short hair and she has the long hair, right? We run a boat and we come in dirty, you know, like our hands are all covered in diesel and grease and everything else. Um, I would say that all of those things are so weird. Um, but you, you get invited to more dinner parties, maybe out in the fleet, that you might. Uh, Packer parties and some of those sorts of things. There's a lot of benefits. There, there are some benefits. <laughs> Is that on? Yeah. So I have a story on that too. So when I was on the North Pacific Council and had been on there for probably six years, and I was also single at the time, running my own boat, the only woman on the council had been the entire time I'd been on there, only the second woman to ever be on the council. Um, and at one meeting, I'd gotten engaged, and the chairman announced that I was getting married. And one of the council members, who are, it, it's a room like this, but packed with people. It's probably a bigger room than this, at the Hilton in Anchorage. And he said, just spontaneously not realizing his mic was going to pick it up, Mary, I thought she was a dyke. <laughs> No, and so, I mean, this probably isn't fair, but my favorite part, or one of my favorite parts, there were a lot of watching Coral and her sister learn to fish and deal with some of the, the obstacles that came up along the way. I, you know, there are a lot of things that break down, and one of the things that I noted when they were growing up on the boat, thinking, oh yeah, this is such a wonderful um, game that we're playing, was that I don't think they ever even looked down into the engine room. Um, so when something first broke down, the, the entertaining part was out on the, out on the grounds that all of a sudden, you know, they'd be on the radio talking about whatever was going on and, and there'd be all these people jumping in and saying, oh, we'll pull our gear and come in and help you. <laughs> I, I don't think that ever happened when we broke down somewhere. I'm pretty sure that nobody ever <laughs> offered to, to come help us. I just want to say I'm in awe of you women who run your own boats. I thought I was up to that because I lived in the cockpit all the time. I didn't want to be in the pilot house because of uh, all the guys talking on the radio and crying. I mean, it was constant. And it finally dawned on me, it was the code. It wasn't really that awful, you know. And the weather wasn't, you know. Anyway, but I just got tired of listening to them complain. And then, um, I don't know, I think we were up in Slocum Arm, and it was early fall, and Bert had a lot of confidence in how I handled the gear and everything by then, and so he said, you know, I'd really like to go ashore and see if I could get a buck, because the beer season had opened. And I said, well, go ahead. You know? So I said, I'll, I'm just trolling in Snoke, Snoke of Arma, no problem. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I suddenly found out what it was like to do it all on the boat and go, oh no, I got, you know, picked up some kelp and I had to clean that off and then where was I going and I had to watch the fathometer and all that stuff and I went, oh, you guys are amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing challenge.
good time to take our break. Thank you, thank you, pal. And we'll take a break for about 10 minutes. We'll come back here at 7.30 and uh, we'll have about uh, 40 minutes of uh, audience participation and uh, some more questions. And during the break, we're gonna have a slideshow. So uh, there's all kinds of goodies in the back and there's forms for signing up to join the Sitka Maritime Heritage Association. Now's a good time to become a member or renew your membership and also to socialize. We'll be I would like all the women fishers or people who worked in the fishing industry to stand up and let's all recognize the women fishers in the audience. Women fishermen in the audience. Another thing an audience member suggested, and I think we, this panel has revealed, and Marie really brought it up at the end, is how the doors have been opened in our generation for the women who want to be the skippers and leader of this industry, the opportunity is open for them and we are all better. Our industry, our resource, our community is better for it. Let's give all the women and the men who helped make that happen a big hand. So, at this time, I know there's other stories out there. What we'd like you to do is if you have a story that you'd like to share, come up, or if you have a question for one of the panelists, now is your chance to come on up. Right here we have the special mic set up just for you. And if you want to, you can kind of hide behind the podium. But I don't think any of the women fishermen need to hide behind the podium here. But anyway, come on up and either ask the panel a question or tell your story, and then if you're okay with that, the pan, that might stimulate some questions from the panel. Who wants to come up first? I know some of you are wanting to come up. So there we go. Let's get Tony here. Hi, I'm Tony Olson, Buzz Carrington. Is that how's that? And I just remembered stepping up here that I deckhanded with Pat and Howard. My first long lining job ever. And uh, it's funny that kind of years have gone by and I'd kind of forgotten that, but Coral and Katie were on the boat. Weren't they on there when we did when we long lined? I'm pretty sure they were. Um, so my story is I needed a change. I lived in Washington State. I was doing forestry work for many years. And um, one day I was doing a tree planting job in the Vendovi Island, little island called Vendovi Island in Washington State and just knew I needed a change really bad. And we had to take a little boat over to get out there and everyone else was huddled inside because it was rainy and blowy and for some reason I was sitting on the bow with the wind and the rain like hitting my face and enjoying it for some really odd reason because I don't now, <laughs> but um, really did then. And I remembered that I had just met a man named Dale Chestnut. I'm sure many of you in the audience know Dale. Dale skippered the Jason B for SPC for many years. And um, decided that I, re I remembered Dale ran a packer and that I wanted to try and get a job on the packer. So I called Dale and I said, do you hire women and do you hire friends? And I actually got his wife, Joanna, who said very skeptically, well, sometimes both. And Dale fortunately hired me, but he told me, please don't quit your state job. <laughs> and I did before I, I asked for a three month leave of absence. They said no. 
And I said, sorry, Dale, but I really want to come up to Alaska. So that's when it started for me. And while I was on the back deck packing for Jason B, I was watching all the trollers come in. And I turned to Dale and I said, Dale, I'm going to buy a boat. And Dale said, really, really wise words to me. Don't do it. <laughs> that's all he had to say, because right away I knew I had to get a deckhand job, and I knew I had to get experience, and um, so eventually, I'll kind of skip that. I worked on the Cario packing one year for Gillnet Fish, and I think it was 1994, because I first fished the Magic in 95. Um, I, this was just a dream of mine, and some friends of mine knew it, and they came to me one evening and said, we know that you really want to do this, so we will loan you the money for a hand troll permit, but we can't help you with a boat. So I had to go on a boat search, and that's when I found the Magic, a little tugboat. Um, what I know now is it was pretty scary, but then I didn't know it. I bought it in the P-Bar for uh, $500 down and $4,000 total and pay when you can. And that was a pretty good deal, except it needed an engine. And uh, that's my next favorite story, is that I didn't know how I was going to get money for an engine, because I didn't really have money for a boat. And I heard Sick of Sound sometimes loaned money. So I walked into Tim Ryan. I don't know how many of you, I hope Tim's not here, maybe he is. How many of you ever sat in front of Tim Ryan asking for money, but I felt like I was at the principal's office, and it was very nerve-wracking. And I remember Tim asked me um, how much experience I had, which was pretty much none, running a boat. And then he said, um, how long do you think it would take you to pay this loan back? And I thought for a minute and said, don't know, I've never fished. And you know, he wrote me a check for the engine. And uh, I'm really grateful to him for that. And um, learned my engine because I hired a mechanic through the day. He would come in the day, work on the engine and line me up at night for things to do. And the that night I would do the work on the engine and the next day he'd come and check it out and make sure I did it right. And uh, that's how the magic came to be. And I had a lot, of, a lot of scary experiences in that boat, learned a lot from that little boat, and then decided, and I hand trolled for three years, and then power troll permits went down. When they reached 18, I decided I better jump on it because I didn't know that, I, that they would ever go below that again. And bought the Melody S and fished that for a loan for, I, don't, I think, three years. And then I met my partner, Paul. And Paul and I eventually ended up teaming up. I, I sold the Melody S and then I fished Paul's boat. He, would, he was in law school, so I would fish the Valiant while I was waiting for... Um, uh, I don't know, lost my train of thought. But at any rate, Paul would be in law school and I would fish the Valiant Hunter. So we decided to team up, and that was a big um, experience in itself. We had a um, lot of two skipper on the boat fights, but I'll tell you two of my favorite that I really love. The first season that we teamed up, we didn't tell anybody we were doing it. That's the year that King Salmon really plummeted, and I decided to sell the melody. and. We'd been together for a while and decided that we shouldn't, um, you know, trying to hang on to two boats was too hard. And so we teamed up and we didn't tell anybody. And I had a real hard time with that, letting go of my own boat. I felt like I was kind of letting go of part of myself and was pretty unsure about it. And I was driving the boat into town one night and Paul started backseat driving. Or it was actually daylight, I shouldn't say night. And I got real frustrated, so I put it on autopilot, walked to the pit, and said, well, I ain't driving. He said, no, 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 go back. I said, no, I'm not driving. He said, well, then I'm not driving. I said, well, then who's driving? He said, well, I'm not driving. Well, me neither. We sat back in the pit with the boat on autopilot. No boats in our way. It's very clear, you know, wide open. Um, that was our first realization that we wish we could hire a skipper and that we both could just fish <laughs> in the pit. That would be great. Um, the next time that he backseat drove, no, I was backseat driving, excuse me. Um, he got upset that I was backseat driving because I was worried we were going to hit a boat. And he was very upset at me, so I got real upset and I decided, you know, the best way to tackle this is with humor. So I put on my sunglasses, covered them in duct tape, and went out and said, here, how's this? Now I can't backseat drive anymore. But I couldn't see anything else either, so it really meant I couldn't work the back deck. And 
we've through the years um, kind of bridged that gap. We've kind of realized when you team up, it's strengths and weaknesses, and um, you just work together to get through it. And I love fishing for many, many years. Right now, my heart's kind of into my garden and my grandson. So I fished a month last year, and if I don't have to fish more than that this year, I'd be pretty happy. But I can see myself coming back to it again. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. saying I should mention that I also want to co-own the magic. Um, but actually, some friends of Nancy's and mine are the ones who, who salvaged it off a beach outside Tenneke, as I remember. It's yellow, solid yellow cedar. It had been having the tide washing through it for years. And they, a couple, salvaged it. Well, you all know Dan Felby. It's Dan's brother and his now wife. And um, rebuilt it. And they put in the cheapest engine ever made, I think. It was a uh, two-cylinder, bright purple China diesel. Talk, talk, talk. Anyway, it was, I, I, I think it was probably a gift to Tony that that engine was no longer in the boat because it was nothing but trouble for us. But it was a, a great little boat, a great little starter boat for Liz and Mike and also for us when we had it. in. Uh, I don't know if it's still around, but just a neat little boat with a lot of story. It was actually built by a guy who cut all the timbers, the yellow cedar, it was local wood, and he cut it all with a chainsaw. And it had a bow stem that was about like that. It was, it was built like a little tugboat. It's just a neat little boat. Well, part of the heritage of, of uh, this business is not only the people, and not just the women fishermen, but we refer to all our vessels as she. Think of that. And that's a big part of our heritage, is our love for these wonderful vessels. Anybody else have a story? I'm sure there are. And, uh, you know, I've talked to some of you, so if uh, you don't step forward, I'll just have to call on you. But I'd like you to step forward and come share your story. I thought that was just great that Tony did. Come on up. Yes, Sherry. There we go. <laughs> Sherry Tunnel uh, really has helped raise the value of all our salmon for her high quality rose fisheries frozen at sea salmon. Please welcome Sherry Tunnel. Well, my first year fishing was 1965. I'd been working on a packer, the NEFCO 11, out of Kedhevenkoff Bay, and it, it was a slow season, so it didn't work out, and I had to go back to town and was going to head back to California to go back to school. And uh, I went to town and got a skiff instead, and my sleeping bag with a friend, and we camped on the beach and hand-tooled. And I realized that that was something I loved to do. So I went back for five years and camped on the beach and hand-tooled each year while I was in school. Most of the time, we made enough money to buy books and pay some tuition. One year, we had to hitchhike home. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience, and I learned that a fisherman told me that if I went to Icy Straits, that's where the real fish were. So I took my skiff up there, and I fished a couple years in the early 70s off of uh, Icy Straits, camping on the beach. And then in the, uh, I, well, we had one year where I, I, I met Lori Whitmill in the early 80s. And I had one year I lost my troll permit because I had entered for limited entry and I didn't have enough points to keep it. And because of a court case, I was able to keep my boat, but I went spot uh, shrimp fishing with Lori and we ran 150 pots off of our skiff and camped, on, and camped on the beach and stayed in town. But I loved the water and wanted to move on. I wanted to live in Alaska, but I had teaching jobs in California that I enjoyed a great deal. And finally, when Lori graduated from college, and I had kind of wanted to move to southeast Alaska, we made the move to come here. We needed to buy a boat, I didn't have any money. But I heard that if you had a power troll permit, that you could use that as collateral to get a boat through CFAB. So I took my credit card and put $30,000 on it. <laughs> I went to CFAB, and we negotiated a boat, 
And we started with the uh, power trolling with the June Rose. And the first day out, we didn't know how to put the float bags on, and we spent a long time looking at it, trying to figure it out, but we finally got there. And that first season had lots of breakdowns, lots of interesting stories, but we had a, a strong learning curve on what to do with our gear, what to, how, to, how to gaff the fish, how to move on. We knew a lot after, after uh, hand trolling. So we, it was kind of a natural to move to power trolling. Lori liked the troll pit. She ran the troll pit, she selected the gear, she controlled the speed of the boat, and I usually would steer and work on cleaning the fish. And I guess about 1992, I kind of had a, a frozen at sea fish that I ate and wanted to move on. So we, we sold our house in Juneau and sold it. We didn't sell the Juneau for two years, but we had the Rose. And the Rose was a 53 foot uh, troller that had been doing tuna in the South Pacific for 15 years. She, uh, she didn't have a freezer on her, but we picked her up in Port. We, we, we put it down on it, on my credit card, $2,000. Another fisherman called me after I'd gone down and said, you can't do that, I want the rose. And I'll put more down, but I'd already made the deal. So we got the rose. And we flew to, we went to Port Townsend. We ran up from Warrington, uh, Washington, up to Port Townsend, and then set to work the winter to get it in shape. I worked on the engines and the hydraulics and taking all the old stuff out that didn't work. And it was an awesome task. And we worked from eight in the morning, sometimes six in the morning, till midnight, trying, knowing we had to have the boat ready to get back up north to get the derby days with the halibut. Lori, meanwhile, got the boat, the inside of it, because it wasn't a place we could live on. And we knew we'd have to live on the boat because we didn't have enough money to live anywhere else. We didn't know we were gonna spend the next 10 years living on the boat. But she got the boat, and she rebuilt the inside of the boat. Everything she did was yacht quality. Everything was wonderful. It was the most comfortable home that I've had in a long time. We got the boat going, we left Townsend, we made the derbies, but we had work still to do on the, on the rows, so we ran it back to Townsend and had to put new mufflers in and science and finish our, our freezer. Uh, we put in a, a direct dry freezer I got out of a junkyard and uh, rebuilt compressors and went fishing. And we worked hard. We had our breakdowns, we had our, our money problems, we had all the things going on, but we had the water, we had being free, we had the fish. And it was something that I enjoyed tremendously. In 19, we, we fished the boat a total of 18 years. And in 1997, we adopted our daughter, Kasia. You got her when she was two days old, and she spent her first five years on the boat. We have wonderful experiences with her when she was about three. Because we had taken her swimming at Sheldon Jackson, she decided she wanted to swim around the boat. And so when we go into anchorages, we put her life jacket on her, and she had a little wetsuit and gloves, and tied a rope around the, the harness on the life jacket and threw her overboard. <laughs> and she would swim around and enjoyed it tremendously. We had warned her about colored jellyfish, and if she saw a colored jellyfish, she screamed, and we would grab the rope and pull her back in, <laughs> and pull her back on the boat. We watched her play with seals, swimming in the water, and the seals diving underneath her. And as, as we fished, every, every night we'd come in, that was her thing, to get off and swim around the boat. Kasia is a competitive swimmer and has been for years. And she still swims today, gets up at four in the morning, three days a, work, a week with Lori, and is still swimming. On the boat, we had a lot of interesting experiences. The people around us were wonderful. One day we went out fishing in PA. We were on the beach. We, because I was a hand troller, I always was a rock picker. And to have a 53-foot motor sailor with 65-foot masks and a freezer on it was kind of demeaning, but we always go into the beach. And we were fishing the beach early in the morning, and Lori was in the troll pit, and we got into fish. And we had three or four fish on every line. And a fisherman called me. Uh, while Lori was in the troll pit, I would run the boat, steer the boat, sometimes on autopilot, clean all the fish, take them in the freezer, and then get back up. And I would always walk back until Lori when I was going in the freezer, so she could kind of watch. But it, it was very rigorous. We kind of did our fishing with aerobics for many years because of the configuration we had on the boat. 
But the fisherman called and he said, I'm watching that redhead in the troll pit. She's a natural killer. <laughs> and I, I thanked him and went back to the troll pit and I said to Lori, you know that fisherman behind us? He says you're a natural killer. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> so we've lived on the boat a long time. We sold the boat three or four years ago. I don't remember exactly how long. But we began to direct marketing our own fish in 2000. We got a grant from the state, and we ran a boat to Seattle and lived on the boat down there. And then I traveled all over marketing fish and generating some things. Uh, we had one store that we're still selling fish today. They had one, we're building their first store. They now have 14 stores and buy a, a, a enormous amount of fish. And I have a, a, a chef who has been buying fish for 15 years, and he, he takes about 20,000 pounds of fish, and he wouldn't do anything else. And he loves the fish, and I have those people that I use as references when I go other places to a testimonial to the quality of what we had to offer with it, wild Alaska salmon. So when I got out of fishing, I didn't have anything to do. We, we sold the boat, and we were very fortunate. I sold my permit. and. Because we had our markets, I, started, I, I had started direct marketing fish for other fishermen and had been doing it for 12 years because we couldn't keep up with the need that we had for our fish. So today I, I run Rose Fisheries and we market fish. And it's, it's something that I consider my retirement. I love to do it, I love the people, and I love the challenge. And Lori runs the business half as well. We jointly run the business and have been doing this for a number of years and it's greatly added to the quality of our life. My daughter's now 15. She was on the honor roll, the high honor roll, this year. She plays the trumpet. She plays first chair in the high school band. She plays first chair in the Sitka Jazz Band, and she made the All-Alaska Band, and she's a freshman. And I think a lot of the qualities that she has to offer came from her beginning, when we were on the troller, and the lifestyle we had. We'd line up the fish hearts and try to guess which one was going to stop. <laughs> she, had a, she had a sandbox on the bow of the boat that we put them in the sand and we were kind of horrified because she was burying the fish guts in there. I don't know what she was saving them for. <laughs> but we had to sift through it daily to make sure that things were okay. <laughs> we had a cat on the boat and our, our, our boat cat was, wouldn't get off the boat. Her name was Fog. And she, she also chattered. She chattered with a, a sea otter. And we were, we were anchored up, and the, the sea otter came beside the boat, and the sea otter had an octopus on its belly, and it had a baby. And you could hear this chattering, chirping sound. And we turned around and looked, and she was chirping, and they were talking to each other back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so the experience out on the water is one that's really satisfying. And I'm really grateful to have been able to participate in it. And Lori and I have jointly done all of the work on the boat. She's the one that picks out the gear and ran the toll pit and gaffed the fish. And she's the one that did a lot of the, of, of the really hard work. We've been together now 31 years, and I think we grew a lot with that experience. Karen Connell, one of the great leaders in our industry. Thank you, Sherry. I was just going to say, I really want Sarah to come up at some point. She must have a <laughs> Sarah knows the real story. <laughs> well, my name's Shirley Perkins. I live in Elfin Cove. I spend my winters here in Sitka now. And, but for many years, I lived in Elfin Cove. But I came to Alaska in the uh, mid-70s and um, in a small skiff. and. Um, put it on the ferry, came up to Wrangell. A friend met us there with a truck and unloaded it. We took our skiff and we went to Noyes Island. Um, we lived on the beach. I had a four-year-old daughter and it was a great experience. Raising kids on boats, there's nothing like it. I think your kids are just, have such um, a wonderful time. They can't, um, 
You can't do that with anything else you do on a nine to five. It's just something great. Um, one thing that um, happened to me is I was lucky to meet Eric's mom. And she was one of my dearest friends. She's, um, she was a really wonderful person. Um, when I got back to Wrangell after fishing at Noise Island, we had enough money, and so we bought a trawler. And we um, fished that little trawler for a long time. It was the Mercedes. And we named one of our daughters after that boat. But we were living down on Bronson Island, and this boat came along in front of the little float house we lived in. And it was Marilyn and her husband, Bill. And they were, um, they had killed a black bear, and they were cooking the roast in the oven. And we could smell this boat coming from a long ways away. And I had never eaten bear meat, but here they came, they pulled up to our dock, and, they got off the boat and, oh, hi, how are you? And we all met and they said, would you like to have dinner? And we said, sure, what are we having? Marilyn goes, oh, we shot this bear and we're having the big roast. And we didn't know that um, Bill didn't like to cook the meat a whole lot, but luckily for us, we all like to play cards. So we got into playing cards and the meat got well done in the oven. And, and that was really good because it was bear meat. So nothing happened bad. And, um, Marilyn was, um, like Eric said, she liked to fish with landmarks because pretty much all we had was a fathometer and a CB radio at the time. And they were pretty much doing the same thing. And uh, they would pick out two places and Marilyn would always tell me, well, if you just go around this point and you go up this side of the beach and then you turn back around and you know, you're gonna hook one every time. We'd go, okay, we never did. <laughs> she always did. She and Bill had a thing about um, fishing where they would, one of them had their gear for one side of the boat and then the other one had their gear picked out for the other side and Marilyn would not share what she was running up and down on her side with Bill and he would always get upset because she was catching more fish and she wouldn't tell him the secret gear. It was just, fishing around them was just really loads of fun for me. But over the years I ended up moving from Dana and Wrangell up to Elfin Cove and um, I ran the fuel dock there and fished some of the time and bought fish and uh, when Pelican Seafood kind of turned around in Pelican, my boss, um, who had the fuel dock there, he said, well, you better think of something else to do, Shirley, because this isn't going to be going on anymore. So at that point, um, I, oh, I had always wanted to have a restaurant, and so I opened a restaurant there in Elfin Cove, and I still have it today, 17 years, and many adventures <laughs> later, but... Um, I will say that having a bar and a restaurant is very much like fishing. So <laughs> you hear kind of the same stories. And it's, it's been fun. Well, that about sums it up. <laughs> One short story, 1973, we had just gotten married and we had a little skiff called the Kokanee. And uh, I'm from Fairbanks and I had never been out on the water before. And uh, getting ready for me consisted of, we had these two gaff hooks and we painted them orange so that if they fell overboard we could find them. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go fishing. <laughs> And we were in Juneau and we were fishing on the bread line out by Tea Harbor and uh, we had a mercury motor, outboard motor and a kicker. I don't think the big motor worked. You sat on the big motor cowling and steered the outboard and um, we're going south on the bread line toward Juneau and uh, I was steering. Eric was cranking and he says, uh, get, the wind was picking up. He says to me, steer into it. Well, 
The only it that I wanted to steer into was land. <laughs> So I whipped around sideways to the wind, you know, and he's like, he yelled at me and he said, no, any idiot knows that that means steer into the wind. And I went, oh, really? <laughs> and I got off the big motor, Kelly, and I walked into the, we had a little cabin. It was wood, it wasn't canvas. It had a little door with a little handle on it and a lock on the inside. <laughs> and I went in there and I locked the door. <laughs> and the rain started and the wind came and he's out there on the back deck. <laughs> he's like, I'm sorry, please let me in. I won't yell at you anymore. I don't know, how many hours were you out there? <laughs> Four or five hours later, anyway, we went into Tea Harbor and he said, I, I'm, I won't yell at you anymore, and he hasn't. That was in 73. So. Next. Next. <laughs> okay. There's not much time. A Shia, who has been skippering this whole operation this year, has uh, said we're going to be out of here by 8.15. So we got time for another story or two. So what about Sherry Mayo? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Hey, I know that uh, Pat Keel has got a story about trying to figure out how to dress a left-handed halibut. Okay, this story doesn't. Is that on? There. This story doesn't have anything to do with being female. It does have a lot to do with being um, green and a green deckhand out there on, you know, your first halibut trip. Um, and that would have been on the Arnie back in '82, I think. Um, so we're out there and we, you know, cruise out and we set all the gear and, and then we're, we're ready to start hauling it back. And, and so we're, we're hauling and, and, you know, it's going along okay. And, and then it's, for, we've been there long enough, it's time. I get to go down and take a nap. I'll, I'll start back a little ways in the story. So I'm down sleeping, probably with my boots on, on my sleeping bag. And, and so... I get this yell, and it's Steve Amos, and he's like, get up, we're in them. And so I go charging up onto deck, and the whole back deck is full of halibut, all the checkers, and you kind of have to walk on the, you know, the, the checkerboards to get to somewhere where you can start cleaning fish. Well, I've never cleaned a halibut before, and, and the thing I didn't realize, I mean, being a female might be a, a handicap sometimes, but being left-handed, on a halibut boat with right-handed skipper, I mean, right-handed everybody. They all go, oh, yeah, you just got here. And I go, okay, and try to figure it out. And so what I ended up doing for quite a while was turning the halibut over and cleaning it on the other side. And so I'm working away and it, you know, it kind of works and I'm learning, getting a little faster, but we were slow and we cleaned and we cleaned and we cleaned. There were a lot of fish. And so, Steve Amos, you know, who a lot of you probably know back from the old days around here, he's, he's back there and we're cleaning and, and so he gets this fish and he, he pulls it up on the hatch and starts in and he looks kind of puzzled and then I see him, he throws it back down off the, off the hatch and grabs another one and pulls it up. Okay, that's kind of odd. And so I get ready and I grab my next fish and throw it up on the hatch and it's backwards. It was a left-handed halibut. And it was like, oh, finally, I get it. This is how you clean a halibut. And yeah, but it's the only left-handed halibut I've ever seen. And I don't know, there, on the slideshow, there was a picture of me with two halibuts, and one of those was a left-handed halibut.
I don't know if this will wrap it up for the evening, but you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you already know, and, and as we've certainly said, that a lot, it's hard work and it doesn't always pay. In fact, it's the only job I've ever had where I've said to people, be prepared to work in the winter to support your summer work. <laughs> but this is why, you know, I, I fish for two reasons. One of them is because I love my six months off every year. And the other one is a story about why I love to fish. And I was fishing in uh, Point Adolphus, and it was in August. And the currents and the tide and the time of year set phosphorescence in really thickly there. The phosphorescence just turns everything green. Where you can sit on the bull ran and you can look into the water and you can see fish swim by because they're so, they're so illuminated by the phosphorescence. And it was one of those very rare cold nights, moonless, with stars everywhere, to the point where you really couldn't, disti couldn't distinguish the horizon. The water met the sky. And I could see the anchor chain all the way down, and I heard this whale blow. And I thought, wow, I really want to see the, I want to see the spout, you know, how do I, I want to see if that happens, right? So I hear the whale moving the shore, moving along the shoreline, and moving along the shoreline. And sure enough, I didn't ever see the spout, but what I saw was the whale. And the whale moved through the water, causing its entire body to be completely outlined in this phenomenal phosphorescence. And I couldn't tell the sea from the sky. And there was this whale floating in the universe. And that's one of the reasons I fish. <laughs> And I just wanted to say along that line, and those who have freezer boats don't necessarily get to do it, but that moment, I live for that moment when you finish the day's fishing, however many hours it may have taken you, and you turn the engine off, whether you're in an anchorage somewhere or you're drifting around out on the ocean, and there's that moment of absolute quiet. And it's just the most wonderful feeling in the world, and you have to work really hard to get to that. <laughs> Thank you to the Marine Maritime, Sitka Maritime Heritage Society for another wonderful evening of storytelling and thanks so much to all of you and this panel. Let's give everybody a big hand. <laughs>